which additions to the Utah football team are the most exciting and will pay the biggest dividends come the start of the 2023 season? We're talking about it on today's Locked On Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Lockdown YouTube your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment matter more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. My name is JT Wistel, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. On today's show, we're going to be going through and drafting the players that we think are the most exciting and will pay the biggest, make the biggest difference for this Utah football team on the 2023 season. Also closing with a little bit of Utah basketball talk. And in order to help me do the draft, it's friend of the show, Nathan Roderick of Ute Zone. And Nathan, I think the first guy when we were going to do the most exciting additions, I'll list as an honorable mention because this is going to be a true draft. We're going to go back and forth, take the guys that we think will pay, will make the biggest difference, the guys that we're most excited to see join the team and see what they can do. I'm going to list an honorable mention to go first in Brant Keithy because obviously he was a part of this team, but he missed out on the main run of the Pac-12 stretch. He missed out on so many of the team's big games, and we saw what a big impact he made in the Florida game. So he is the guy, just in terms of any addition or just a guy getting back because he felt like he was absent for so much of the team's biggest games that I am so excited he's returning for another season and will be involved in the biggest games for the Utes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think there was a little bit of uh, some recruitment there as well towards the end of the year. So I would definitely count that as a recruiting win for the University of Utah. Absolutely. So when it comes to the first pick in the draft, Nathan, since you are a guest, I'll let you start first. Who are you going with? I am going to go with uh, Miles Battle coming from mm. Ole Miss. Yep. Uh, I think looking forward to what he brings to the defensive backfield, especially considering his length back there. Um we loved watching Clark Phillips last year, but I think bringing Miles' length to replace Clark will be a great addition to the uh, defensive backfield. Uh, with the departure of RJ Hubert, you're going to see Clayton Isbell back there as well. So the defensive backfield is going to be very long, and they're going to be able to cover some ground. Yeah, I love Miles. I mean, he was going to be a guy that was going to go. I don't. He was going to guy that I was going to go to very quickly. So six four two zero five guy from Houston, Texas. Couple seasons with the Rebels out there. And guy who look had six passes defended last season has or excuse me four last season had eight in 2021. This is a guy who's gone against the best in the SEC too. He's faced off against Alabama. He's faced off against Georgia. All the other talented receivers that conference has. He didn't see as many snaps this previous season. That's why he's coming over to Utes. But a nice veteran in the room that can provide presence on the outside. Getting that corner room mix with Zamaya Vaughn with JT Broughton. Smith Snowden, CJ Blocker also factoring into that. So I am I'm excited to see what he, Miles Battle is going to be able to do. For my pick in terms of the guys I'm most excited about for this coming season. Gosh, there's so many good players on this list, but I'm actually going to go with what I think this Utah football team with the biggest need was last season, a reliable kicker. I'm taking Cole Becker from Colorado. I think this team really missed a presence that could hit from 30 to 40 yards reliably. I think it put Andy Ludwig in a lot of really poor positions that he had to try to draw up plays on fourth and eight because Utah was kind of in this no man's land where it's like, we should trust our kicker here, but we can't. But when you got a guy like Cole Becker, who look, you know, Colorado wasn't very good. But Cole Becker, he was very good. He was 84% on his field goals overall, 95 on his extra points. His longest of the season was 49. He scored 53 points overall and just extremely accurate from distance, as I talked about. He's a guy who hit five of six from 40 to 49 yards. Absolutely incredible. And if the game is on the line and it's like a 50 or 51 yarder, rather than try the Hail Mary, I might even turn it over to Becker. So I really think he's also a guy on kickoffs. He can kick it out of the end zone. How nice is that going to be to have next season? So I'm really excited about Cole Becker, and I think he's a guy who's going to be able to give this Utah team a boost with his leg. Yeah, I think Kyle Whittingham especially is very exciting. Yeah. Excited for this addition because it changes his whole game plan. You can tell last year, you know, towards the end of the half and end of the game, you know, he had to change his game plan because there wasn't a, a long distance kicker to be able to rely on. And then, like you said, what was so frustrating about some of the games last year is that Utah wouldn't be able to put the ball in the end zone and it caused, you know, the return team didn't give up a touchdown, but there were some close calls. Uh, very close calls, especially against USC, that first matchup. It seems like, you know, even when Cam scored that two-point conversion, you're like, holy crap, they might run this back and yep. it's not over yet, even uh -huh. though there was 
hardly any time left on the clock. Um, my uh, my next pick, I'm going to go with uh, Emery Simmons uh, from Indiana. I just think he'll be given a big opportunity pretty quickly. Um, being a veteran in the room, he had some time at North Carolina as well as Indiana. He caught 37 passes last year for the Hoosiers and had 408 you know, receiving yards. He also had a couple of rushing attempts towards the end of the year. Uh, Jalen Dixon will likely be gone. And so there's yep. some opportunities for Emery to come in and he's a speedster. He likes to get behind the defense and can attack on the edges. So I think he'll get his shot pretty early on. Yeah, I think this is great to get another veteran there. This is Alvis Witted, the new Utes, new receiver coach coming over from Wisconsin. This is the first guy he's brought into the program. So what is he gaining in that also? It's another grown-up in the locker room and a guy who's going to be really aligned in Coach Witted's vision for what he wants in this program. So I think they're going to be on the same page. He's going to be an extension of him on the field, kind of that extra coach, and just a guy that you have faith getting it done. We look at some of the things he's done. He's got it. Well, first of all, if you want to see an unbelievable catch, look at his catch. I believe it was against Pitt back when he mm-hmm. was up with uh, UNC. An unbelievable kind of play and could provide a hint to some of that red zone threat. I like that you brought up Jalen Dixon there. But looking at what he did in 2022, 37 receptions, 408 yards, and a touchdown Look, this isn't a guy who's going to light the world on fire, but I think he's going to do a lot of productive things. We haven't seen a Utah receiver light the world on fire in a while. We're looking for a reliable guy who can get open and make those extra plays, right? We have Devon Vele back. We have Brant Keithy coming back. So who's going to be those other guys? Money Parks and Emory Simmons is one of those other guys who should step in and be a nice, reliable presence. Those 408 yards he had last season were a career high for him. He's gotten steadily better each season. Started with just 72, then 201, then 243. Also, but looking back at that 2021 season, he averaged 20 two yards a catch so you can tell he's a guy who can stretch the field to kind of provide that extra speed on the outside this is a utah offense that we know is trying to get more explosive we talked about it a lot last season so i think simmons is a guy who's going to provide that extra speed and ability to stretch and i think that's a good call by you to pick him up there all right so moving on to the next guy i'm, I'm going to stay in the portal i'm going to keep keep it going with leovani de i think when you're talking about de coming in veteran from stanford look he's a guy with 31 tackles last year a sack 76, um, 31 solo tackles, but I mean, 76 tackles in 2022, 86 in 2021. So a really productive guy. And I think the biggest thing he's going to provide to is not just a reliable presence, but a guy who can drop back in coverage to a really good job. We saw Diabate really struggle in coverage last season. Damuni is not going to struggle in that regard. I think he's a guy who does a good job locating the ball to strong tackler, good speed on the interior. And I think it's another veteran who's going to adjust very well. We saw last year Stanford transfer playoff pretty good for the Utes and Gabe Reed. I think this one will as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's, um, you know, so guaranteed that he's going to start day one. I think uh-huh. that's his expectation. It's he's coming into a very crowded linebacker room, but watching Stanford last year, you know, he made a couple of plays uh, in rice cycles that really opened yeah. my eyes. And you're saying that's a guy that I want on my team. Um, mm-hmm. And Stanford was pretty bad last year. One of their worst teams, you know, in the last decade or so. But he was a highlight on that defense, and he was all over the yes. place uh, when he played the Ute. So really looking forward to what he brings. And he's also a local kid. He played his uh, high school ball up in Mountain Crest. So I'm mm-hmm. sure he's really looking forward to playing in front of his family. Um, with my next pick, I'm going to go with our first recruit uh, go. that's going to have an impact in 2023. And we're going to go with Mikey Matthews. Oh, I just got one. upgraded to a, to a four-star here on 247 mm-hmm. Sports. Um, he had an incredible uh, camp circuit last summer and then played well in high school. And then the, after his senior year, got invited to one of the All-American games. And that's where Mikey eventually got that bump. Um, he was going up, up against Cormani McLean, which will be a matchup to see in the uh, the Pat 12 in the coming years as uh, McLean committed to the Buffalo a few weeks ago or to the, to the Buffaloes of Colorado a few weeks ago. And so Mikey Matthews is going to be my next guy. Um, like I said earlier, there's going to be a lot of opportunities, you know, in that receiver room for someone to step up. Um, you know, last year there wasn't as many for like a transfer or a new guy to come up, but this year I think there will be because that was such a void at the end of last year. Yeah. We just didn't have much to go to after Brant and Dalton, especially in the Rose Bowl. Um, it was just a glaring need there in the Rose Bowl game. And I think Mackie Matthews will have a role on this 2023 team. Yeah, this team's always looking for more explosive playmakers on the outside, and that is exactly what Mikey Matthews is. I remember last uh, year, Utah was really excited about a guy in Ryan Peppins. Now he ended up transferring um, 
back to another school. It's escaping my name off the top of my head right now, but Mikey Matthews, also an early on enrollee. When you're trying to play in your first year, that's really important. Jalen Glover, an early enrollee, saw a lot. Lander Barton, early enrollee, saw a lot of time too. So I really think Mikey Matthews being an early enrollee, you mentioned the explosiveness too. He's a strong route runner, good hands. Just a guy who, simply put, knows how to get open. And he's going to be a very valuable asset to this Utah football team. We're going to come back in a moment for my third pick in our 2023 Exciting Editions draft in a moment. But first, we want to talk to you guys a little bit more about our friends at FanDuel. FanDuel is the your one-stop shop for all things Super Bowl 50 in terms of sports betting. They're the only app you need at your Super Bowl party. They're America's number one sports book. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they are that number one sports book in America. FanDuel, and if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports super fun and easy. You can download FanDuel now so you can get a Bet Super Bowl 57 with getting on the action with a no sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, Vandu lets you bet on everything from the money line to the point spread to who will score a touchdown. Vandu Sportsbook is super easy. The app is safe and secure to use, and you can also get paid in your winnings instantly. There are tons of great zany Super Bowl bets out there. What better place to get it on the action than at FanDuel, especially when you got the no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57 there. So make sure you guys join FanDuel today at dot slash locked on to claim that no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment matter more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, coming back in to our draft with Nathan Roderick of Ute Zone. And you just took Mikey Matthews. That's a really good one. There was what there's one other guy on the board though that I'm really excited about. And I was as much as I didn't want you to take Matthews, I'm really glad you didn't take this guy. That's Logan Fano. Logan Fano coming over from BYU. Look, he didn't play last season because he had the ACL injury, and those can sometimes take a little bit to get back to form. So we'll see if he's the same. He had his surgery done in March 15th of last, March of 2022, so we'll see what he looks like come spring ball this season. But by the time fall camp rolls around, I, I think he's going to be ready to go. You're talking about a guy's 6'4", 6'4", 240, just an elite recruit coming out of high school to a guy Utah was bummed to miss out on. He's a four, He was a four-star, and I just think once he gets that speed and explosiveness back up and ready to go, I think he's going to be a threat. I think he's going to see a couple snaps this season. I think we'll see his full potential realized in 2024. I just think it'll take him a year to get back into it a little bit. I, Logan, I hope you prove me wrong right away, and I hope you're the best pass rusher on this Utah roster, but I just think it's going to take a little bit of time, but I am really excited about him. I think he's a guy, too. I mean, people forget. He had 115 tackles as a senior, including 95 solo tackles and a whopping 20 and a half sacks, a absolute monster number. He's got great hands, good speed and bend off the edge. I'm really excited for Logan Fano and what he can provide as a reserve is the role. I think he's going to end up playing the 2023 season. Yeah, I think with the departure of Gabe Reed, uh, there will be you know some opportunities. There's some younger guys like you know, Chase Kennedy that will likely huh? get a chance as well. Um, but that defensive end role is something that Utah needs to improve on in the off season and bring more pressure and contain the edges a little bit where they got exposed a little bit last year by, you know, Anthony Richardson and DTR, you know, there should be some playing time available for Logan. If he, uh, if he works hard enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I believe this is my last pick, correct? Uh, well, I've got actually a few more after that. So you got a couple you more, got a couple more. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go with uh, Dijon Stanley mm -hmm. um, nice. athlete, uh, a track guy. Which he just he just ran a uh, 33 seconds in the uh, 300 meter dash, um, mm. which is kind of an interesting race, I guess. I've never heard of the the 300 meter. <laughs> However, Dijon is an he's technically a running back, uh, but he's an athlete listed here on 247 Sports, and mm -hmm. really looking forward to what he brings to the table. And because he's such an athlete, I think Makai Bernard coming back m might limit his opportunities, yep. but he has a role similar to Mike Makai on this team and can damage the defense you know on the outside with his speed and then also you know up the middle um the running back room is a little crowded right now but i'm really excited about Dijon and what he brings to the table mm -hmm. yeah he's i mean when you just talk about an athletic freak a guy who's just going to go out there and make plays with his game breaking speed i think this guy could see some time on special teams early on especially too so i i'm really excited to see what he's going to be able to do because just get the ball in his hands and see what happens or just fly down there with reckless abandonment on kickoff and make things happen. It's going to be exciting to see what he can do. So for my next pick, I thought we were on to the recruits, but then as we were kind of sitting here and going through these guys, I'm like, I feel like there's a name we're missing. And then it clicked for me. When you talk about additions, there was a guy on this Utah football team we saw back in 2020, but then went and served his mission. So we didn't see him in 21 or 2022. 
line. That's Nate Ritchie. I think when you look at him coming back, he's going to have a chance to compete with Clayton Isabel for that starting safety spot. When you look at what he did in that short in 2020 season, he led the secondary with overall 28 total tackles and added a fumble recovery and a pass breakup. He had a career high seven tackles against Washington. This is a guy who was rated the number one, number four recruit out of the state of Utah coming out of Lone Peak back when he left the Knights at that point and got the one year with Utah, then left for a little bit. And now he's ready to come back in. And look, I think he's looking at it like he left and he's like, dang, I left it that they have their two most successful seasons. Now he has a great opportunity to come in and build off of some of that success too. So I think Nate Ritchie is going to make a huge dividend for this team and definitely see a lot of time on the back end where he's just going to continue to break up pays plays where whether it's him and Cole Bishop or Bishop and Isabel, I think Utah secondary is going to continue to be a force to be reckoned with. And Ritchie is a big reason for that. Yeah, I think what was so impressed about Richie is his football IQ. And he was able to come in, you know, as a true freshman in 2020 with limited, you know, game experience, you know, that year with only playing a couple games. Mm -hmm. He looked like a veteran out there. And yeah. he looks like some, you see him play and you get glimpses of guys like, you know, Chase Hansen or you know, Cole Bishop that are just athletes at yeah. safety and very high football IQ, great tackler, and looking forward to the plays that he can make in that defensive backfield. Um, there you go. Your, this one's your final pick now, Nathan. Okay, the last one that I'm going to go with would be Spencer Fano, the oh, uh, the brother of Logan. Nice. Um, he also just got back from the, the All Polynesian Bowl down in Hawaii, where he was playing up against the, the nation's best, some four five star kids going to Texas A and M and all those big programs. And Spencer held his own. Um, he got a bump in his rating, you know, for as a recruit, and I think. He has the body and the build to uh, to put on some pounds. You know, he's a li li little bit light right now, you know, standing at 6'4", but, and I think to really compete at the highest level, he'll need to put on some weight. However, his technique is some of the best I've ever seen coming from a kid from high school. And I think that he'll get a shot to play day one. Um, you know, you got to replace Braden Daniels and you lost Paul Miley to the transfer portal. So there can be some shuffling you yep. know, within that offensive line. And there could be an opportunity for Spencer to get his nose in there and, and get some reps, you know, starting from day one. Yeah, it is going to be a great opportunity for him. And look, I'm a big fan of Spencer Fano. I think he's a fantastic tackle when you look at what he did at Tim Few. He's not going to be ready to play on the outside in his first year at Utah, but I mean, he's a guy, give him some time. He's going to be a dominant force for this team. One of the best recruits they've ever gotten. Just a force at the offensive line position. Great technique, outstanding strength. You mentioned his success at the Polynesian Bowl. He's a guy who really can play all five positions. So I think it's going to be interesting to see if he can factor in at that center or guard rotation, whether he – it's going to be really hard for him to win the job, but whether maybe there's an injury and he can put himself in the position to be the next man up, that's going to be really exciting to see. So we reached the final pick of the draft, and dang it, because I make the rules, I'm taking two guys in this spot. Smith Snowden and C.J. Blocker. I'm gonna. We're going to need to see a lot more in spring ball to kind of see – actually, not even spring ball, excuse me, because I believe neither of these guys are um, – early enrollees. Yeah, they're actually not early enrollees. So we're gonna have to wait till kind of fall camp rolls around till we really see who has the edge or garners a little bit, but I'm taking Smith and blocker as guys. I both think are going to see a couple snaps on the outside. I don't think either of them are going to be straight up starters early on, because I do think the starters are going to be a combination of miles battle, JT Braun and Zamaya Vaughn. Of course, I think those will be the corners for this Utah teams along with Richie Isabel and Bishop on the back end. But I really think these guys are going to have a chance to do special things early on. Both four-star recruits, both playmakers on at the defensive back position, do a good job staying sticky in coverage, got good hips, good hands, good reaction times, and can take some of those passes away too. So I don't know how much we'll see them in their first year, but I think they will contribute. And I can already see the big third down where one, where those guys break up a pass and they do the thing every DB does, and a rice cycles just goes absolutely wild, Nate. Nathan. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think you know, Sione Vaki will likely hold on to the nickel spot, you oh, know, going point. into the offseason. Yep. But I think either of them, you know, they're not going to beat out Sione, but he, they'll be right there, you know, competing mm -hmm. for that spot and could see some opportunities maybe within a dime package, perhaps. Yep. Um, also on special teams, you know, kickoff and punt coverage. You know, they're fast guys that you want in, in that coverage to be able to make a tackle. And so those two, it's it'll be interesting to see how they come and compete with each other. They you know, both four star guys, you know, coming in as at corner, um, and I'm really excited to see you know how they bond together and what kind of relationship they have because it's gonna be a competition from day one with those two.
It is. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And I love that you brought up Sione Vaki. That was a guy I did forget when I was running through the corners like that. He was an absolute stud for this team at the nickel spot. So definitely think he's going to be able to hold on to that and continue to make those big plays for this Utah football team. It's going to be fun to see. But either way, when you got a group of this load players, whether it's for the future or the short, short term in a lot of these transfers, it's a really exciting group for this Utah football team. Speaking of excitement, there's been added excitement this year when it comes to Utah men's basketball. But that got dwindled a little bit as of recently. When you look at the win against Oregon State at that point, Utah in the season was 15 and 7. But then it was a little bit disappointing because I think two and everyone would have taken two and one. Three and zero oh would have been awesome if you look at that stretch where they took on Oregon, Stanford, and Cal. But unfortunately, Utah went one and two in those games, and even more unfortunately, Gabe Madsen got hurt too. So the loss to Stanford in particular really stung. We had Josh Newman on the show last week, and he was talking about Utah hadn't had any really bad quad three or four losses since that Sam Houston game. And since then, that's kind of really changed now with that loss. So it feels like the future outlook of this team has changed a little bit, but it's still been a massively successful season for the Utes. They've already won. Now they're up to 16 wins overall. So 16 and nine on the season. I mean, they only won 11 games last year. It's already a huge turnaround for Craig Smith and his team. And they got an opportunity to coming up. They'll get Colorado on Saturday. I think for me, the biggest thing that concerns me going forward with this team in the short term is just the bench production. For whatever reason, Mike Saunders Jr. hasn't really factored into the rotation. So Jackson Brenchley gave them some nice stuff recently, but Stefanovic has looked great filling in for Gabe Madsen. Unfortunately, no one's been able to replace his production off the bench, really. We'll see if Brenchley can sustain his success. I'm personally a little skeptical about that just because he hasn't just shown that ability over the course of his tenure with the Utes. So I, I'm still excited to see what this future of this Utah team holds in the short term, but they got some questions they need to answer. And unfortunately they're coming up on the toughest stretch of their season. Cause after Colorado it's Arizona schools and California schools being UCLA and USC. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And coach Smith touched on, you know, getting some bench production in his press conference, you know, even after yesterday's game, I think it, we're all a little confused about what's going on. And we saw Jackson Brenchley get um, a good shot yesterday and he, played well for the Utes. However, guys like, you know, Wilgins ex exact and, you know, Mikey Saunders, they're going to be, at they're going to have to step up, you know, with the conference tournament coming up. It's not something that you can just roll with six guys and, you know, play 35 minutes, you know, each guy you're going to need guys like Jackson Brenchley or Wilgins to come in and make a couple shots uh, to fuel your team. And like you said, it was a very disappointing loss against Stanford and, you know, we hadn't really seen a loss like that for a long time, which was so yeah. frustrating because it was a home game um, coming off a, you know, a split with the Oregon schools. You really wanted some momentum, you know, going into this last stretch of the year. Um, and it was a game that, you know, Vegas had the Utes favored uh, by seven points, I think. And so the Utes just did not play well at all. Um, and since Gabe has gone down, you've seen you know, Lazar Stefanovic step up a little bit more. He's been the leading scorer in the last three games. Yeah, career. High However, we need, Cardinal. right, and we need to see, you know, Brandon Carlson get back to being that leading scorer as well. Um, he's played well in the last couple of games, but I think he's there's more to come from Brandon, especially coming up against Colorado. They don't have a great center. Uh, they have a sophomore that plays about like 25 minutes, is about seven foot, but uh, nothing that, you know. Brandon should be worried about. Yep. And I was really looking forward to what he brings to the table the next couple of weeks because Utah needs to depend on him and his leadership. Yeah, I'm looking at, you know, mention that game with Colorado. That's the fun one, right? This coming Saturday, Utah gets a nice long break after that Cal game, basically six days, so can take some time off, rest up, work on a couple of things, and really scout the buffs all in. One nice thing that Utah has, this is a Colorado team, really struggled on the road. They're one in seven on the road. They're 14 and 11 overall. Utah, six and nine excuse me, 16 and nine. They're 11 and four at home. So this does feel like a good get right game for Carlson. Team stats are very particular when you look at them up and down. Uh, Colorado allows slightly more points. They also score, like they score one more point than Utah does per game. The field goal percentage is even at 48 rebounds right around the same, assists around the same. Although Utah almost, they're at 14.9, so nearly at 15 to their 13. But this does feel like a great opportunity for Utah. On national television, Fox Sports, that Saturday night game at 8 o'clock. This feels like a great opportunity for Coach Smith and his team to get it done. And Nathan, looking ahead to the game, I think they will get it done, and I think Brandon Carlson has a statement performance in this one. We're going to see him over go over 20 again and shoot it really efficiently from the field because he had uh, he put up 13 and 12, I believe, versus Cal, but they held him in check in terms of shooting percentage-wise, forced him, I believe, he was like 4 of 11 or something like that. I think this is a game where you're going to feel his presence all game long, and he's really going to dominate the box score with a couple of big-time blocks too. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I just, I think, you know, Colorado doesn't really have the size to to keep up with him. Uh, Brandon was shot a little too much from the three yep. last game. Um, yeah, he got a little too comfortable. Um, and it was, his shot was just a little bit off. Um, I don't want him to stop shooting at all. I think he should definitely you know, keep that three-point shot in his arsenal because he does shoot at a high percentage from there. Just wasn't working from him for him yesterday uh, against Cal. But I think he'll be an X factor coming down the stretch and especially against Colorado, because like you said, this will be a get right game. And if Utah, you know, wants to continue the success, you know, Colorado at home is a must win in my opinion. I 1000% agree, especially look NCAA tournament already in a lot of doubt, but NIT being able to host games still very well and strongly in the card. So Utah has got to keep it up and keep that momentum going. And, I feel like they'll be able to do so, and it's going to be fun to watch and see how it plays out Saturday and the rest of their season. Nathan, really appreciate you coming on with us. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, JT. If you guys are in the market for a second listen every day, make sure you guys check out the Locked on College Basketball podcast where hosts Isaac Shade and Brandon Patton take you around the world of Locked on Basketball. They go everything you everything you need about college basketball in one place. You can hear from big experts, insiders, coaches, and players. It's Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Big thanks to Nathan once again for joining us. That's going to do it for today's edition of Locked on Youth. But come back tomorrow, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about how these transfer additions affect other players and coaches on the Utah roster and talking a little bit of Britain Covey in the Super Bowl, all that and more on tomorrow's edition of Locked On News.